Uh, you have to bear with me. My presentation will be a, a quite a bit different. I'm not bringing you scholarly views on um, ageism or on uh, the stigma faced by um, older adults. Um, I uh, purposely uh, put the background of the slides of the Mental Health Commission of Canada because uh, for me, uh, I'm the chair of the Seniors Advisory Committee, but uh, for me it also is probably the one organization that really got me to think about stigma um, and the impact of stigma um, in, in a major way. Uh, mind you, I have lots of things on my mind, so you know, for, for one topic to occupy good space on my hard drive is, is uh, but you know, this one really is. Um, when I present, I'm always asked to have a disclosure slide. Usually it has to do with drug company funding. <laughs> but uh, when thinking, it's not a bad idea before we present to uh, kind of present our biases. <laughs> so I thought I would put them on my disclosure slide. What would be the biases that I might have uh, for a presentation on stigma and aging? And I can tell you, um, and you'll discover this as I go on, that my own background, my own personal experiences with aging and with mental illness, uh, particularly as a daughter, as a daughter-in-law, and as a sister, will likely influence the discussions we'll have today. So I'm just warning you. <laughs> and professionally, I've had the privilege of accompanying many, many seniors in their journey to recovery and well-being. And um, I continue to learn as I'm aging. So I'm trying to, I'm already starting maybe to dispel a few of the myths that get in the way of older adults. Okay. Oops, this one. Okay. Oops. All right. Try to press the. My objectives for today is to get you to think really about some of the ageist attitudes that influence the provision of mental health care, uh, focusing on depression and dementia. I'm not going to cover everything, just a couple of examples. And a stimulate a discussion on how all of us in our personal and professional roles, we can make changes that will reduce stigma and discrimination across the lifespan. And as I was listening this morning, uh, and reviewing the, uh, the schedule, I thought it would be really ironic if by um, uh, having special populations, we uh, fail to uh, keep in our mind that what we're all going to be telling you about stigma and discrimination is that we all want to be viewed as a person in our own rights, with our own background and experiences that we want people to consider when um, they talk to us or they talk about us. And in that vein, I think that when we're talking about anti-stigma strategies, when we're talking about programs, we should avoid um, uh, pegging groups uh, against one another or uh, making things so different that um, you know we can perpetuate stigma by saying um, you know well you'll see what I mean by that perpetuating stigma from youth to old age for example would be an example that I wanted to comment about so we you all know about stigma I'm not going to uh, labor this uh, definition it's just a definition for me to to help me realize that at times because of stigma, older persons are excluded, rejected, blamed, or devalued. And in our current society, this is quite common. I want to talk more particularly about the stigma associated with age. And a couple of definitions here, ageism, the prejudice or discrimination against or in favor of any age group. And it's a form of discrimination that contributes to social exclusions of seniors in particular. The New York Academy of Medicine asserts that ageism, unlike racism and sexism, is widespread and 
overlooked and accepted in Western cultures, including in the workplace, in healthcare, and in the media. Additionally, it's been suggested that negative ageist attitudes contribute to elder abuse. So now I'm going to take my first little break. I'm going to ask you to wave your, your hands. So how many of you in this room have um, a professional background, social work, occupational therapy, just um, physicians? Um, OK. How many of you uh, in some of your roles uh, have um, contributed to uh, the development of services, healthcare services? in some ways. All right. Yeah, OK. How many of you in this room are contributing to teaching and education? Great, OK. All right. Keep all of your different hats in mind as I'm going on with my presentation. So now I'm going to ask you to reflect for a moment whether, try to answer this question. How much are you looking forward to your 60s, 70s, and 80s? Let you think about that. And if you are looking forward to it, why? What would be good about that? Retirement coming, <laughs> coming up, right? And how, in what way is retirement something to look forward to? Sorry? Having choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having choice, having time maybe to do the things that, that we might want to to do more of. Okay, it's not just about doing less of, it's often about doing more of other things that uh, in our uh, adult life we feel we haven't quite had enough time to, to do. Next question. I'm not asking the group to answer out loud here. Have you ever been tempted to lie about your age? I have to tell you a story. There was a little piece in the newspapers about Alzheimer's disease, and there was a picture of me. And um, a last minute call saying, can we put your age on the newspaper piece? And uh, I was not in a private setting, so I had a staff around me. And the secretaries were saying, lie, lie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I said, well, you know, there's, I have a problem with this. I said, if I lie and if I say that I'm older than I really am, they're going to say, wow, you know, she looks young, but they're going to think that I'm a lot older. If I say that I'm younger, they're going to look at the picture and say, oh my god, you know, she really looks old <laughs> for her age. And that's not going to be good either. So in the end, I decided that no. Uh, my age is my age, and I'm comfortable with it, and um, that's what should be the newspaper. But we are living in a culture of youth, youthfulness, looking young, acting young, um, and you know that influences uh, that that will have some influence on whether um, we think about older adults, whether we think about old age in our everyday decisions, whether it is as a healthcare provider or a healthcare funder. Can, this question is very easy, so I'm going to ask people if they have the answer to this. Life expectancy after age 65. So if you've made it to 65, how many more years do you think you have ahead of you? 15 is not enough. Okay. It's at least, probably at least 20, and it's probably getting a little, a little more these days. Do you think that's too long or too short? I'm not going to ask you to answer that one, because this is very much tied to what you think your life is going to be like as you get into that age group. And the last question here is, can we prevent aging? 
anything that you can do not to have your birthday. There are some people who, who have little tricks about that, about not <laughs> declaring their birthdays or celebrating their birthdays, but really there's nothing we can do about getting older. Do you think that aging affects one's potential for recovery? And I put there, do you think it affects it for better or for worse? I want you to keep an open mind about this one. Right? And the last one, do you think that seniors should be independent or accept help? And when you think of yourself in your 60s, 70s, 80s, how easy or difficult will it be for you to live with the values that we um, currently have in our society? All right, enough thinking. <laughs> Some of the um, ageist attitudes uh, that we encounter, and I'm just gonna name a few of them, not all of them. But older adults are not productive, not useful to society. They require care, they block hospital beds, and they will bankrupt the healthcare system. Now, am I making this up, or do you read any of this at times in the newspapers, or, right? Currently on the ledger of human capital, seniors are seen as negative, not so worthy of investments or sharing in resources, including healthcare resources. They block access to appropriate hospital care for younger adults, and um, even when it is needed. So we've talked a lot about emergency rooms. Everybody, all, I think, gave examples about emergency departments. And for the elderly, um, they're often called GOMERS. GOMERS are an acronym for get out of my emergency room because we don't want to admit older people to hospitals. Now, not that older people particularly want to be admitted to hospitals, but um, there's this fear currently in the Canadian healthcare system that older people admitted to hospital will be there for too long, um, they're gonna be stuck there, and they're gonna take the place of someone else who more rightfully would deserve the care that we provide in hospitals. So many common themes with what um, you've heard this morning. And currently we're making seniors feel like they're a terrible burden on society. The other um, attitude is older adults don't have much time ahead of them. Now, now that you've been thinking about that this morning, you know, 20, 25 years is, is a fair amount of time after age 65. And when I started in my career, there were very few um, psychiatrists who wanted to work with the elderly. That was my choice. People just couldn't understand me. They, they just didn't get me. They said, well, couldn't you do something else? So I was, uh, by default, associated with, um, you must be really bad <laughs> that, you, <laughs> that they won't take you anywhere to work with younger people, <laughs> you know. So that was the one, that was one comment that I often got. Things have changed a little, but not, not that much. Um, it's also the issue of how much time people have ahead of them um, is, when you consider the business models that we now apply more and more in the healthcare system, really puts older people at, uh, very much at risk of being perceived as though, you know, there's not enough time ahead of them to warrant the investment in their health. So just be careful of our directions in the healthcare system to talk about business models. The reason behind my question about can we uh, prevent aging, can we stop ourselves from getting old, is the following. Um, if we can't stop aging, 
then why include seniors in health prevention and health promotion strategies? It's interesting that when you look at the literature in the health promotion and, and prevention arena, that there's very little that is talked about in terms of doing some prevention work with seniors. So just food for thought. And if older adults have a lower chance of recovery, which they don't, um, and, and well-being, why invest one's times and energies in treatment? So the other comment that I would get uh, at the beginning of my career was, well, you know, why work with old people? They're old. They're going to die anyway. Um, they're at the end of their life. They don't have that much time ahead of them. Why work with old people? completely ignoring the notion of, well, because they are persons with lived experiences that are interesting and valuable, and because I can make a difference in that person's life and well-being. And I remember this conversation with an 80-year-old 80, 80 gentleman who, who had a bipolar illness, and was saying, well, why do you look after me? You know, like, you, there's so many young people that you could look after. I mean, even my patients were trying to direct me away. <laughs> and, you know, it's going to be a waste of your time. And I said, look, you and I don't know how much time we have ahead of us. And I said, I could die tomorrow in a car accident, be gone. You can be around for another 15 years, and then what? You know, you want to suffer like this for for this amount of time, let's see what happens. On his 95th birthday, <laughs> he, after being well for many years, um, we both agreed that it was well worth the investment uh, <laughs> of time. All right. Now on to uh, the impact of age and ageism on depression. When I ask you those questions about aging, how many of you were looking forward to your 60s, 70s, and 80s, other than the retirement bit that might have been interesting, um, I think most people have the notion that getting older is depressing. Um, and that's, that's a fairly wild-held belief. Not everybody, of course, but that's a fairly wild-held belief that aging in itself brings only bad things. It brings you arthritis, it brings you chronic, chronic health conditions, uh, it brings you losses, it brings you all kinds of negative things. And so most people see aging as depressing in itself. The corollary to that is because aging is so depressing, particularly in a youth-oriented society, therefore it's normal to be depressed when you're old because aging is so depressing. So you lose the sight that depression is an illness that could be treatable, for example. And there's um, very marked under-recognition of a very treatable illness in old age. You know, the, the potential for recovery and well-being uh, from depression in older adults is excellent. Um, and they can enjoy very good quality of life and be very active um, to contribute to their societies, their communities, with successful treatment of depression. But if your view, let's say, as a family physician or as a nurse uh, working in the front line, is that aging and depressing, and therefore all, it's normal for older adults to be depressed and look depressed, and then you can't change aging, you might, by association, say that we won't be able to change the depressive symptoms either through treatment. Or comments such as, well, they'll just become depressed again because they're just going to be older in a couple of years and they're just going to have more losses in a couple of years and they're just going to get depressed again. So that was the other comment that I would get is the recidivism. You know, how, uh, what will happen, they will get ill again. And in fact, our experience when you study depression in fact, yes, it is an illness that has a tendency to recur over time, but it's not inevitable. And with treatment and interventions, 
depressive disorders can be well treated um, and um, you know well controlled with um, with treatment so that you can lead a normal life now these two factors in the arena of depression partly explains the high rates of suicide in Canada for elderly men that's the highest rates of suicide that we have in Canada now you hear about youth suicide rightfully so it's a tr you know it's tragic when a young person dies but we rarely hear about suicide in the elderly um, in older men because that's not worthy of news <laughs> um, and that's because you know we have our own views about aging and when internalized ageist views also prevent seniors from, from getting help. A little word about ageism and dementia now. Changing topic, Alzheimer's disease. The other commonly held view is it's normal to experience memory problems as we age. So if it's normal to experience memory problems as we age, that will lead to very late identification of Alzheimer's disease. And, and even though Alzheimer's disease is an illness for which we have no cure, it is important to identify the illness fairly early so that people can prepare and put in place the kinds of supports that will allow someone with dementia or Alzheimer's disease to live a life with dignity. Without that, the diagnosis or the problems get identified on, not on, until crises develop. Maybe a car accident. Maybe debts accumulating because someone is forgetting to, to pay their bills or paying more than once. Um, there might be fires in the home. By that time, it's difficult to maintain one's dignity. <laughs> Um, when the illness is so clear for, for everybody to see. At the same time, spouses and children, I'm going to come back on the themes of families, then spouses and children get blamed. Why didn't you realize that there were these problems? Why did you continue to let him drive? Why didn't you? <laughs> um, and the blame for neglecting to this um, is really so unfair because another comment that was made is services are often not accept, you know, accessible. So even if you have a family who is able and willing to identify, um, establish a diagnosis, then you don't have necessarily the, uh, a management plan that you can put in place. These crises often lead to loss of independence and the blame for not respecting one's wishes. I think that any of you, every Canadian family actually, will be having to deal with this illness at some point in time. So your experience so far with older adults, have older adults in your personal lives been helping you or requiring, requiring your help? Are they fun or boring to be around? Are they nurturing or draining? Are they a good source of learning? Are they respectful toward you, whatever age? Are they respecting their peers? And based on successful contact, I'm gonna make the link here with anti-stigma strategy. Um, if, you know, one of the things that really help people not have such stigmatizing views of aging and mental illness in, in aging uh, is to have been lucky enough through their lives to have successful contact. So my personal experience uh, is that older people in my life, they've been my best teachers, the most nurturing, the most practical, the most helpful. They provided me with vital help and support, uh, emotional, practical, or financial with my family. They had incredible resilience in dealing with losses and stresses that so often occur during the course of aging. And they provided support to their peers in welcoming communities. 
So at, during the discussion, I want you to think about anything that we can do in our personal lives to one at a time, one small community at a time, one small family at a time, do something to change these ageist attitudes. And if one's experience with seniors was that they made a full recovery from the depression, and that they were able to engage meaningfully in the treatment of their bipolar illness or other psychotic disorders, and were able to achieve stability, predictability that allowed them to be um, enjoying and participating meaningfully in their communities, what if health professionals had that experience of seeing people who are, are living with Alzheimer's disease and their family caregivers actually being able to share in laughter and having the satisfaction of responding to the care needs with grace and understanding without guilt? So my question is, are we creating opportunities for healthcare providers and future healthcare professionals for those types of contacts. I will end here. <laughs>